this, I, I'm excited for today and I hope it goes well. Because uh, if you blow it when you're really excited, it's like one of those Sundays where you go home and twice as depressed as usual. So, Jehu or Jehu. Okay, today I'm going to maybe say Jehu or Jehu. I'll go between them. Who thinks it's Jehu? Hands up. Oh, man. Who thinks it's Jehu? All right, we're going Jehu. Okay, 2 Kings 9, Jehu, one of the greatest heroes, in my opinion, in the whole Bible. Is this going, Jim? Awesome. Jehu. Okay. He's, this, he's got the sort of name and he lives the sort of life that almost makes you want to rip off your flanny and spin around going, Jehu! Doesn't he? Doesn't he or not? Yeah, he does, doesn't he? Now, in a narrative, we're going to go through a whole chapter, which means if you just listen to my voice for the next half an hour, you're going to get bored. So the way we're going to do it is that I'll read the first slide. And then from then on, every slide that comes up after that needs a volunteer to stand up and read it out, okay? If you can't read it, it's just one per slide. If you can't read it from the screen because your eyes are too far away or whatever, just read it out of your Bible, okay? Let's not do that awkward thing where we sit there and wait for somebody else. There's only like 10 or something, so we'll take turns. And if no one goes, I'll keep going. And then you'll be like, gee, we hear Dave a lot. So, 2 Kings chapter 9, tell me when you've got it. Yeah, yeah we got it? Yeah. Such a cool story. And along the way, we'll make some comments too. Okay, Jehu, 2 Kings 9. The prophet Elisha summoned a man from the company of prophets and said to him, okay, just a quick clarification. Elisha mentored these up-and-coming prophets. And by all accounts, this could have been the first assignment that this young prophet got sent on. Okay, he said, tuck your cloak into your belt, take this flask of oil with you, and go to Ramoth Gilead. The flask of oil, according to tradition, most, li most likely held about 250 milliliters, okay, which is a cup, okay, like a cooking cup. Okay, so take this flask of oil, go to Ramoth Gilead. When you get there, look for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Go to him. Get him away from his companions, take him into an inner room, then take the flask and pour the oil on his head and declare, this is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and run. Don't delay. <laughs> what? How's that for an assignment? Okay, go and get a commander of an army away from his friends, take him into an inner room, tip a cup of oil over his head, and then just run off. Okay, um, who wants to read the next one? Okay, Lana, big voice up, stand up nice and loud. So the young prophet went to Ramoth Gilead. When he arrived, he found an army officer sitting together. I have a message for you, commander, he said. For which of us asked you who? For you, commander, he replied. Okay, awesome. That doesn't need much clarification. Who wants verse 6 to verse 8? Yeah, I'll do uh, Oh, Maddie, then Hillary. Okay. Me? Yep. Okay. Jehu got up and went into the house. Then the prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people, Israel. You are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master, and I will avenge the blood of my servant, servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. The whole house of Ahab will perish. I will cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. Okay, thanks. Hillary. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jer Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, son of oh man, <laughs> As for Jezebel, dogs will devour her on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and no one will bury her. Then he opened the door and ran. <laughs> okay, so he was obedient. Took him to a room, tipped him oil, gave him the word, opened the door and ran. Now, I know in Christian circles we sometimes get a few kooky people, but this is up there, right? If someone did that to you today, you'd be going, what? That was so fun. Okay, verse 11. Who wants to read this one? It's a short one. No, no, you can't have two goes, Mr. There you go, Carlos. Uh, when Jehu went out to his fellow officers, one of them asked him, is everything all right? Why did this maniac come to you? Do you know the man and the sort of things he says? Jehu replied. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Read the next one and then I'll clarify a couple of things. So who's got the next one? Yeah, Dad. Cheers. 
That's not true, they said. Tell us. Yahoo said, here is what he told me. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. Uh, they quickly took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Yahoo is king. I like how he's Yahoo now. <laughs> right? Okay, I love this. Okay, so he gets a, a cup of oil tipped over his head. Okay, and then he comes back to the fellas in the room and they say, What did that maniac want? It's like, nothing. I mean, could you imagine your friend? Like, if I anointed you with a cup of oil, you come back, you're slipping over yourself, you're glistening, like you are covered in oil. What do you want? Nothing. Right? <laughs> what happened? Nothing. They're like, that's not true, tell us. Jehu said, the Lord anoints you king of Israel. And do you see their reaction to that? They're like, oh, yes! Rip their coats off and they're like, Jehu is king. Right? There's this authority that comes with the anointing that he has. Hey, I love it. Okay, verse 14. Who wants to read this one? It's a long one, but geez, it's a good one. Yeah, Tone. So Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi, conspired against Jer Jeram. Now Jeram and all Israel had been defending Ramoth Gilead against Hazael, king of Aram. But king, but king Joram had returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds the Arameans had inflicted on him in the battle with Hazael, king of Aram. Jehu said, If you desire to make me king, don't let anyone slip out of the city to go and tell the news in Jezreel. Then he got out Sorry, got into his chariot and he rode to Jezreel because Jeram was resting there and Ahaziah, king of Judah, had gone down to see him. Thanks, Tone. Do you see something cooking here? That's what I love about the narratives and the stories. They're so detailed, especially in Kings and Samuel. Like, it's something's happening. Jehu's gotten into his chariot and he's starting to head there. Okay. Uh, verse 17. Who's going to do this one? We're running out of the willing volunteers. Soon it's going to be the designate, designated volunteers. Yes! Then he went into his chariot and rode to Jezreel because Joram was... Re oh, sorry. When the lookout standing on the tower in Jezreel saw Jehu's troops approaching, he called out, I see some troops coming. No, no, the whole, that whole... Get a horseman, Joram ordered. Send him to meet them and ask, do you come in peace? The horseman rode off to meet Jehu and he said, this is what the king said, do you come in peace? What do you have to do with peace, Jehu replied, sword in behind me. The lookout reported the messenger has reached them, but he isn't coming back. I love this, okay, so they're watching from the city and they see this little band coming towards them. You can imagine, it's the Middle East, there's dust coming off the wheels of the chariot. They're running towards us, so it's like, well, you sent the messenger out there you know, the disposable ones. Go and find out if this guy comes in peace. Do you come in peace? Jehu says, what do you know about peace? Or, this is none of your, this is above your pay grade. Fall in behind me. But, All right, I'll join your band instead. Okay? So, next one. We're up to verse 19. I love this. Oh, thank you, Ophelia. So the king sent out a second horseman. When he came to them, he said, this is what the king says. Do you come in peace? Jehu replied, What do you have to do with peace? Fall in behind me. The lookout reported, He has reached them, but he isn't coming back either. The driving is like that of Jehu, son of Nimshi. He drives like a man. Yes! <laughs> Another one comes out. Do you come in peace? Get behind me! And the, the cloud of dust is getting bigger because many more people are joining the band, right? Heading towards this city, like you can see it's cooking. Get behind me as well. Jay, who's driving like a maniac, whipping stuff and just running down the street. Oh, verse 21. Who's got this? Yeah, Pete. He sat on the chariot, Joram ordered. And when we switched up, Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, rode out. Mummy's boys out there now, right? 
Now, Jezebel is the quintessential, quintessential harlot of the Old Testament, like the worst, seductive, evil, manipulative, like gross woman you can imagine. And we'll see more about what's got her to this position soon. But how can there be peace when your mother Jezebel is letting idolatry just run rampant? There's more to this story than just an overthrowing, right? There, there's a spiritual battle happening as well when idolatrous strongholds need to be just torn down. You know, so Jay, who's the one? How can there be peace when there's witchcraft and idolatry abounding? Okay, I love it. Um, verse 23. This is a good one. You're going to want to read this if you like um, action movies. Who, who likes action? Pete, all his hand was straight up from 23 to the end of 25, mate. Then King Joram turned the horses around Uh, and just that last little bit, now then. Yeah, 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 just as the Lord said. Okay, Naboth, do you guys remember this story from 1 Kings? Okay, what happened is that Jezebel's um, husband wanted this field next to the city that belonged to Naboth, this guy Naboth, okay? And he couldn't get it. He went up and he said, can I buy this field off you? Naboth said no. And then he said, oh, well, then can I give you a better field instead? And we swapped. And he said no. And the king goes home and read 1 Kings, I think it's 1 Kings 9, and he's all sullen and sulky, moping around. Jezebel comes up and is like, why is your spirit so downcast? Why are you, basically, why are you being a, why are you being a baby? And, and he's like, Naboth won't give me the field. And she's like, well, I'll get it for you. And what she does is set up like an ambush. And then in the ambush, she sort of gets these two, and it says scoundrels in the biblical language, to accuse him of blaspheming God. And so he ends up getting killed, and um, Jezebel gets him killed, goes home and says to her husband, okay, the field's yours now, you can go and claim it, which was allowed according to the custom, okay? And so at that time, there's a prophecy saying, this field's gonna come back, and the people who stole it will get the vengeance they deserve. One thing I like about the Bible is when it all lines up like this. Elijah even hears about it and gives the prophecy. Elijah says, um, this is what the Lord says, wasn't it enough that you killed Naboth? Must you rob him too? Because you have done this, dogs will lick your blood at the very place where they licked the blood of Naboth. Okay, this is a prophecy before today's event. Keep that in mind because something that's coming that's going to fulfill this. Okay, so it's in that same field that this guy gets shot and dragged to the side. I love it. Okay, uh, verse 27. Verse 27. This is why the Bible's alive. When I first got saved, I read 1 and 2 Samuel, and I was like, whoa, this is such good stuff. Okay, who wants this one? I'll do one more then, and you can get your courage up for the next one. So when as a Ahazah, <laughs> king of Judah, saw what happened. He fled the road to Beth Hagen. Jehu chased him, shouting, Kill him too! They wounded him on his chariot on the way to Gur near Iblium, but he escaped to Medigo and died there. Does anyone find that a little bit ironic? Because Medigo is also known as Armageddon, and so he escaped there to get away, but that's where he died. <laughs> Love it. Um, his servants took his chariot... Uh, took him by a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him with his ancestors in the tomb in the city of David in the 11th year of Joram, son of Ahab, as Ahiah had become king of Judah. Okay, so it's nearly coming to an end. So if you want to read, now's your chance. Who wants to read this last bit? It starts getting good. Prophecy coming to pass. Verse 30, who wants it? Yeah, Thomas. And Jehu went to Jezreel. 
When Jezebel heard about it, she put on eye makeup, arranged her hair, and looked out of a window. As Jehu entered the gate, she asked, Have you come in peace, you Zimri, you murderer of your master? Dude, what a detestable woman. I can't stand her, man. <laughs> Putting on eye makeup and arranging her hair, looking at like, you, Jehu. Do you know what I mean? Just that seductress. I can't stand it. Okay, so have you come in peace, you murderer of your master? And then, oh please, someone, someone who, no, you can't, you've already had a turn. Uh, you don't want to read this part anyway. Do you want to read this part? Okay. born eunuchs and some are made eunuchs. I assume these are from the second um, group of people that have been made eunuchs to serve the queen. Now who's on my side? Yes, we finally get our revenge. I love with one word from an anointed authority of men, who's on my side? They grab the queen, absolute treason, and just piff her off the edge of the, the, the tower. Splats, blood, horses trampling, prophecy fulfilled. It's awesome. Okay, verse 34. You gotta read yeah. Jehu went in and ate and drank. Take care of that cursed woman, he said, and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. But when they went out to bury her, they found nothing except her skull, her feet and her hands. Yeah. So he's just sitting down for a bit of wine and some food, and in that time she's been reduced to some skull, feet and hands. Uh, verse 36 as we start rounding it out. It's the, it's the last one. You, you, you're going to love it. Roz, you take it home. They went back and told Jehu. He said, this is the word of the Lord that he spoke through his servant Elijah the Tishbite. On the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs will devour Jezebel's flesh. Jezebel's body will be like dung on the ground in the plot at Jezreel so that no one will be able to say this is Jezebel. Wow. I, I want to say not like dung on the field. Actual dung. Like dogs ate her and then digested her all over the place. Like that's what happens to someone who stands against God, right? This is, and this is a prophecy of Elijah coming to pass. Now you might be thinking, what the heck are you thinking, Dave, bringing a story like that to church? Well, first of all, it's in the Bible. Second of all, it's a good encouragement to us who at this point in time as a church are seeking what it's like to be called by God. You know, we've just been going through Romans and we, uh, we, we've been, we got our theology straight when we looked at the first half of Romans. We were reminded that it is by grace we've been saved, not, as, you know, not by our works, it's a gift so that no one can boast. And then the second half of Romans is, okay, well, what do you go and do about that? And it's live a missional life empowered by the Holy Spirit, changing lives. And then we start getting examples from people like Jehu, who just go and get about the business of the kingdom. Jehu was nothing, he wasn't more or less special than you. He wasn't more or less called than you. He wasn't more or less gifted than you. He could very well be someone sitting in our midst here. See, that's the thing about being used by God, is that God wants to use all of us, including people like Jehu, including in this fashion. Most likely, you're not going to have the thrill of going to physically overthrow a kingdom, shoot someone in the back with an arrow. All that stuff's probably not in your wheelhouse. It might be, I don't know you all that intimately. But you're still called to be obedient the same way Jehu has been called. We all are called. And so when I read stories like this, this isn't just some distant memory or something that happened a thousand BC. This is our heritage. This is what it looks like to be an obedient man and woman of God. Someone who stands up for what is right. Someone who stands against evil. Someone who says yes to God's call. And someone who walks in the authority of their anointing. That's what we see here. 
Okay, so I'm going to give you some of my observations, what I learned from Jehu, and then you're going to have a little chat or a think about what you learned from Jehu. Okay, the first thing I learned is that when God calls, it's time to listen and obey. Remember he goes out of the room, God's called him and anointed him, and he comes back and his friends go, what does that maniac want? He's like, nothing. I think sometimes we do the same thing. Like God's put a call in our life and people go, oh, what are you called to do? I'm like, nothing. No, we are actually called to make a difference. We're called to bring Jesus to our workplaces. We're called to stand up and listen and obey. And I, I get a hunch that there's been something being birthed on the inside of a number of people in this room. God has been saying, I really want you to do this. And it's time to say, yeah. It's time to just say, yeah, I'll do that with you, God. Like Jehu did. He's going to give you the tools to make it work. So from what I learned, the first thing I learned is that when God calls, it's time to obey. And then with the call comes the authority or the ability to live it out. There's no reason those horsemen should have turned around and followed Jehu. There's no reason the eunuchs should have chucked Jezebel off the tower. That was complete treachery. Yet it was able to happen because God was behind the call. When you're called, you also have the ability and you've got the authority to let that call play out. Please don't think that Calls that are extravagant, like dethroning Jezebel, are more important than your call to lovingly minister to your neighbor. It's not about what the call looks like. It's about how we live that call out. So if you're called to lovingly minister to your neighbor, this passage says to me that you also will have the authority and the ability to live out that call. You'll have the authority and ability to be patient when they're not kind to you. You'll have the ability to show them love when they don't reciprocate. Do you know, when we're called, we just got to figure out what God's calling us to, and He'll give us the authority, and He'll give us the ability to live it out. You guys agree? Yeah. Don't you reckon He will? Yeah. He promises He will. Third thing I learned from Jehu is that sometimes the call is messy. Especially when you're called to stand against evil. That's not a clean story. You don't see Jehu in many of the kids' Bibles feature that heavily, right? <laughs> hey, there's no like, Jehu in the battle of whatever Ramoth Gilead song. There's Joshua in the battle of Jericho, right? When you're called, it can get messy, especially if you're standing in the face of evil, especially in a culture that thinks evil is good. And especially in a culture that is inventing new ways to express evil. And if you stand up against anything that's not progressive or whatever, like if you stand up against it, you're seen as archaic just for having views that are different to everybody else. It's going to get messy if God has called you to stand against evil, against brokenness against injustice. Some of the ministries some of you guys are engaged in will be shared over who's who in the zoo over the next couple of months, but a lot of them take courage and guts. And to be honest, when I hear about some of the things you are doing to stand up against injustice, I get frightened on your behalf. God has called us to get in and have a fight. You know, when Christians stop fighting against evil and stop, and stop fighting against the for forces of the enemy, we start fighting each other. As soon as the church loses its call to be obedient and starts losing its fight against the enemy, we'll fight each other and destroy each other. Any church that has ever split, you can trace it back to a time when they got apathetic about the kingdom. When they got apathetic about mission, when they started focusing on things that don't matter. Remember last week's sermon? We're not going to do that. We're not going to focus on things that are divisive. We're going to stand together and fight for the kingdom. And if we ever stop doing that, if we ever start fighting each other, it means we've forgotten that there's a bigger fight against injustice, against brokenness. So I learned that from Jehu. And I also learned lastly that when God calls you, he also sustains you. 
I think sometimes we're frightened to say yes to the things that God is asking of us because we don't think we can do it. And counterintuitively, that's a good place to be. Because we don't want to operate in a place where we can do it. We want to operate in a place where we're available and God does it through us. And that's not based on our power, but His power through our weakness. He will sustain us if we get to a place where we say, you know what, God, I'm, I'm a willing servant in your hands asking you to help the kingdom come through my feeble attempts. God's not looking for perfect people today. He's looking for willing people and he's wanting to sustain you. Isn't that exciting? His sustenance, his nourishment, his nurturing is just waiting there for your taking. You just step out and say, let's go. There's a lot to learn from narratives like Jehu. And they're just four things I've got by spending one week in the passage. I want to encourage you as we go through this series, start digging into the characters. In chapter 10, the saga continues. It's pretty much more of the same with Jehu. He gets killed in, the, in a little while. I mean, you can't live a life like that and last too long. But like he's in chapter 10, same thing, just, you know, obedient and ruckusly for the kingdom. These are some of you in this room who are called to be a bit ruckusy in the kingdom, ruffle a few feathers, you know, break down a few religious strongholds, mess with the people's misconceptions of Christianity. That's okay. We're not all called to be clean cut. Do you know what I mean? You're allowed to be messy. Jehu was messy. You're allowed to be in the fight. You're allowed to be in the work site and bring your real you. Mm. I mean, one of the worst things we do sometimes in Christianity is minimize the raw like enthusiasm that we're born, that God has infused in us and, and diminish that to just be good humans where God's called us to be bold humans. Mm. 